Hello, I'm Tony Antolini. It's very nice to see you. We, of course, can't really see each other, but I'm pretending you're all here as you have been in past summers. Each talk um, that I give before these concerts will be approximately 45 minutes. And the musical examples will not be played in the middle of the talk. Instead, we have a new idea. We will have the examples, if there is time for much of that, at the end of each talk. And while the examples are playing, you will see pictures of the performers so you can imagine who they are when you hear the actual concert. The music that you hear in this series will all be taken, the examples will be taken from the archives of Bay Chamber concerts. These are not samples taken from some other source. There are many resources that you can have at any time that you would like to add to your enjoyment of this experience and they are free, most of them are free. Never forget the great value we have if, of YouTube. YouTube performances include all kinds of wonderful videos where you can see the performers playing. There is, of course, also um, the subscriber series such as YouTube Music and Spotify, but you don't have to spend money on that if you don't feel like it. For those of you who are interested in a truly educational experience, if you use Google and type in the name of the piece, you can find sometimes, in, in many cases with this repertoire, the score, and you can watch the score as you listen to the music. It's a great way to sharpen your uh, music reading skills. So, I'm going to be gesturing to my assistant, whom you cannot see, but who would certainly uh, deserve applause if you could give it, and that's Josie Davis. She is doing all of the production work for these presentations. Now, usually when we meet, we have questions and answers at the ends of these series. And I'd love to be able to have your questions, your comments. And so I'm giving you now on the screen an opportunity to see how to get in touch with me. You can email me. And if I understand the technology, you can hear my voice and see the uh, slide at the same time. Um, I'm also on Facebook Messenger. And even though we can't have live questions and discussion, please feel free to get in touch with me. I'd love to hear from you and hear any suggestions you may have. Hello. Thank you for tuning in again. This is a discussion of another giant of the 19th century, Robert Schumann. And for those of you that are new to classical music and chamber music, it's important to um, memorize that this man is Schumann, and not to be confused with his predecessor, who is not related to him at all, Franz Schubert. In fact, there is a rather strange <laughs> occurrence that um, in the times when Germany was divided into two, uh, the East German government, the DDR, the German Democratic uh, Republic, issued some postage stamps and they wanted to have a series lauding different composers. So they issued a postage stamp. It's now, of course, worth a great deal to collectors and it had a picture of Schumann on it, but in the background was a song by Schubert. And when some musicologists noticed that it was an official publication of the government, they shut the print, uh, the print of uh, printing presses down and reissued the stamp with Schumann's song. But don't you fall into that trap. Schumann and Schubert are very different composers, even though they 
spoke the same language, and lived in the same century. Robert Schumann was born in Zwickau in Saxony, which is in the middle of Germany, and he had an um, early introduction to great literature because his father was a bookseller and shared with him the great German literary works. So Schumann, uh, like a lot of young people, had a great interest in music but didn't think that he could make a living at it. So he went to law school, but it didn't take him long to discover that law was definitely not for him and he switched to music. His career originally headed in the direction of being a concert pianist. And Schumann had um, made great progress as a pianist and the stories about this vary whether this was um, some kind of accident or whether it was um, actually a misguided idea that some physician had given him, but it seems as if there was some attempt made to strengthen his fingers using some kind of exercise device. And of course, these days, the med medical people would be able to give you a, a better description of it, but he created for himself an injury in exercising his fingers with this device that eventually made it impossible to play the piano. It was a terrible, misguided effort. However, his career in studying the piano was very much interwoven with his life experiences because <clears throat> Schumann fell in love with the daughter of his piano teacher. This is one of these stories that has wound up, I'm sure, in films. And those of you that love films might want to delve into films that romanticize the story of Robert Schumann and his eventual wife, Clara Wieck. Clara was the daughter of Friedrich Wieck, and she was um, in love with Schumann, and Schumann wanted to marry her, but things got very ugly between uh, Schumann and Wieck, and of course at this point he was already, um, I think, not able to play, and so he didn't want his daughter marrying this guy, and he hired a lawyer and tried to prevent this from a legal point of view. Eventually, he was resolved to accept the marriage, and I think it was like the day before they got married, he finally decided to call off the lawyer. Um, Schumann and Clara had eight children, and of particular importance here is the fact that they were very close friends with the other giant of the 19th century Romantic German period, and that is Johannes Brahms. Brahms became a family member basically, even though he wasn't related to them. And music history, from that point on, interweaves Brahms and the two Schumanns, and then after Robert Schumann died, Brahms and Clara become a very close, uh, very close association, and it's um, unclear whether this was romantic or platonic, because Brahms was considerably older. But Brahms and Clara have a musical history together that goes on to the end of their lives. Very important to keep all of these various characters in mind as you listen to this music. Schumann, having given up playing the piano, began writing for the piano, and uh, his wife was um, such a prodigious virtuoso pianist that she could play anything he wrote. And it was a very fruitful relationship. He composed, she played. <clears throat> so up until 1840, that's all he wrote, just piano music. Now, after 1840, Schumann began writing other kinds of music. And this is a very important thing for us to pause and think about. Because when you look at the history of 
composition, different composers in different periods, under different circumstances. It's very unusual for a composer to write music of different genres at different times in their life. Now, we see a little bit with Bach, because Bach wrote to order, so to speak. When he went to Curtin, he was living where his boss, the prince there, wanted instrumental music, because they didn't have a lot of church music in that particular denomination. So Bach was writing music to order. Haydn, another composer whom we won't talk about in this series, also wrote music to order because he was in the employ also of nobility. But Schumann isn't writing music to order. He's writing music to satisfy a creative urge. And yet, his works, when you look at them, are written in bunches. And we'll discover in a moment why that may have been. But when you look at his output, it eventually became very broad. Orchestral works, songs. When I say songs, I'm talking about a solo singer accompanied by a pianist. There are um, some uh, special kinds of songs in this output that are called song cycles. And here, for example, um, there is a um, cycle that all singers eventually learn called Dichterliebe, which is the poet's love. The poet was a very famous German romantic poet named Heinrich Heine, and so it's especially interesting to think about this being a work of Schumann to set to music because he was exposed to all of this poetry because of his bookseller father. In a song cycle, you get a series of poems that often tell a story, and each poem is set as a separate song, but when they are performed, they're performed in order. There are symphonies. He wrote one opera. It's not particularly uh, performed frequently. Some choral works, although not many. Where Schumann really has a big place in the musical history of his times is his chamber music. And then, of course, it's important also to realize that Schumann was a writer and musicologist as well. He was the editor of a very important musical journal called Neue Zeitschrift für Musik, the new journal for music. He founded it and he was an editor. This was, in his time, considered one of the finest musical commentary journals that there was. So we have him writing music, setting poetry and uh, <clears throat> important literature to musical settings, and writing about music as well. Now, I hinted earlier that we might be able to find a reason why he writes in these bursts. And of course, it's interesting from our point of view that we know so much more about medicine and psychology than they did in the 19th century. Freud wasn't even known at that time. But it's pretty clear if you read about the way he worked and the way he lived that Schumann was afflicted with bipolar disorder because he would go into periods of deep depression and be unable to do anything and then he would go to the opposite extreme and have these enormous bursts of creativity. And you can see that this is so because of the number of works that are written in short periods of time. So he gets into one of these creative bursts and it's as if he can't write fast enough. He attempted suicide two years before his death in 1854. And after he was rescued from the attempted suicide, he made the decision to go into a mental asylum. He didn't want to continue to try to have Clara take care of him. 
Clara and all this um, family of children really couldn't cope. So he was admitted to a, a mental asylum, and two years later he died of pneumonia. Now, medical history is a very interesting field for those of you that are in the medical field. There is something that might particularly interest you in that some medical experts have devoted themselves to going back and looking at the life stories of famous artists and being able to use our greater uh, medical knowledge to explain what may have afflicted a particular composer. After Schumann died, they performed an autopsy and found um, a brain tumor. And this, of course, is a separate issue from the bipolar behavior. But they also found evidence of mercury poisoning. Now, mercury in those days, it's hard to imagine such a thing would happen. But mercury was used when um, Schumann was a young man as a treatment for syphilis. And we know from examples of letters that musicologists have found that he probably had contracted syphilis. And the treatment at that time would have been mercury, which, of course, now we know is a deadly poison. And there is evidence that it was mercury poisoning that eventually ended his life. We have now one of the greatest pieces for this particular model. This summer, as I've said earlier, is an example of Chamber Music 101. And what you're getting here is probably the quintessential example of a string quartet with an added piano. If you had to choose the best of Schumann, this would always be in the list. It's probably his most frequently performed work. And the model, as I have um, described it for you to imagine, is a string quartet arrayed in the usual way with the piano behind them. The piano is, in this particular case, a kind of um, force unto itself. It isn't just one-fifth of the ensemble. It's almost, now I know I'm on thin ice here saying this, and um, some musicians would say, oh no, 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 you're completely wrong. But in certain places, it's almost a concerto, where the piano is dominating and the, the string quartet is supporting. But let's also consider the importance of this piece in what it did in music history. This served as a model for also very famous and wonderful compositions for piano quintet by Brahms, Franck, and Dvorak. And all of these piano uh, quintets are constantly being performed in chamber music presentations such as what we have at Bay Chamber. Now, here's um, another example and reminder of Schumann's mental state. It's hard to conceive that a piece of this size could have been written uh, as quickly as it was, but he was in one of his creative outbursts. To sketch it out, we know because he kept a diary and a um, Clara was constantly helping him organize things. It took him five days to sketch this entire piece out on paper. And then he sat there, and in two weeks, he completed this piece. Now, if you compare that to other works by other composers, very often there will be a period of a month, two months, sometimes many months. Some composers would start a piece and then put it on the shelf and take it off and work on it another year. But with this piece, Schumann did the whole thing beginning to end in two weeks. He dedicated it to his wife. And here we have one of music history's most stunning little vignettes. 
Clara got the flu on the day of the premiere and was in no shape to play it. So Felix Mendelssohn said, oh, I'll play it. Now, these days, if you had a sick pianist, you could call another pianist because most really good concert pianists would know this piece. But Mendelssohn had never seen it. Mendelssohn sits down at the piano and sight reads this piece. Now keep that in mind as you listen to the performance. Andy Wolf will be playing the piano part. Can you imagine somebody sitting down at the piano and sight reading this piece? I can't. That gives you a view of Mendelssohn that we need to keep in mind when we think about the word genius. So, looking at the bigger picture, 1842, this was the music histories of Schumann refer to this as his chamber music year. In this year, he wrote three string quartets, this piece that we're talking about, a wonderful piece for piano trio, that's piano and um, two other instruments, a fantasistic means a fantasy piece, a um, bunch of other chamber music that I didn't put on the slide, but the piano quintet itself seems to have been inspired by Schubert's Piano Trio Number no. 2 in E flat. There are some very interesting similarities. Both of them have a funeral march, and both have finales that take material from an earlier part of the piece and recycle it. So it's clear that Schumann was influenced by his predecessor Schubert, but just how much of it came bubbling out of him is the stunning uh, fact here. All right, next slide, please. This piece was um, subject to some criticism. Mendelssohn, having played that site, took Schumann aside and he said, you know, in that third movement, the second trio needs some more work. It's not as good as the rest of the piece. Now, not many people would take a composer of Schumann's stature and tell him that. But Mendelssohn, he could do that. And Schumann took him seriously. So when you look at the history of the piece, that section of the third movement is completely rewritten at Mendelssohn's suggestion. Not Mendelssohn didn't tell him what to do. He just said, I think you can do better. And he did. Now, we get to a comment that I made earlier, and I said I would return to this. The criticism of this piece, especially at the time when it got to be known, is that the piano part dominates, and that the string quartet is kind of relegated to um, kind of supporting role. So if you look at the criticism, one particular um, Schumann scholar, Homer Ulrich, makes the point that the piano is attempting to counterbalance all the strings rather than being one-fifth of the piece. So you get a string quartet as an entity and a piano as an entity. But as a result of this criticism, a good pianist will often realize that they should not dominate. In other words, don't turn this into a piano concerto, because it's almost a piano concerto, but not quite. It's chamber music. The other thing to bear in mind here is the history of the piano. Pianos came into prominence around the time of Beethoven. There are no pianos in the Baroque period. It was an invention. And as pianos became more and more mechanically sophisticated, they went from what is often called these days in historical circles, early music groups, a pianoforte, which is really a different instrument from what you see on the stage at Rockwell Opera House. It originally had a wooden frame. And it had a gentler tone. It could not 
be as dominant as a nine-foot Steinway concert grand of today, which has a metal frame and all kinds of refinements that allow it to be a far more powerful instrument than it was when it was invented. So bear in mind that the piano itself would have sounded different in Schumann's time compared to what it sounds like today. First movement. We've seen this before. I mentioned in a previous talk that the sonata form usually has two themes. Schumann does what Mozart had already experimented with by having three themes. So as you listen to this, you will get a sense of um, more going on in the exposition than ordinarily would be the case. The opening, everybody playing together, then turns into a song-like melody. Theme two, you can pick out where the cello and the viola are having a conversation. Theme three, very heavily accented material. Then, as in all sonata forms, these themes are put into a mix master and experimented with. But what Schumann does here is kind of interesting. He's presented three themes, but he leaves the middle one out in the development. He just works with one and three. And then you hear that middle theme when he gets to the recapitulation and things are uh, then reintroduced. The piece simply ends. There is no finishing section uh, called a coda. Second movement. Now, this is the one that will stick in your head. If you have um, a problem with earworms, this is the one that you will think of as you drive home or, well, you know, I'm thinking of going to a concert, but of course you're not. Da 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 it's a funeral march, and as I mentioned in an earlier slide, there is a trio by Schubert that also has a funeral march in it. In this case, it's basically what we call a rondo form. Now, rondo is not a form we've talked about yet in this series of talks, so let me just digress for a moment and mention to you that a rondo is related to the Italian word for something that is round, or something that comes around. In this case, it's literally what comes around goes around. There's an A idea. The da 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 da, -da would be the A idea. Then a contrasting idea is introduced. Then the A idea returns. So it's come around again. We saw this a little bit in the um, Bach Brandenburg concerto where I was talking in a previous talk about the word ritornello, a refrain, but with the refrain, it's the same tune and then maybe varied. Here, it's new material, and then the funeral march returns. So we get contrast, return to the funeral march, something else, then I've used A prime and B prime because when it returns after the C idea, it's a little bit different. Just a little bit different. And then when the B returns, it's a little bit different. And then eventually the theme will return as we first heard it. So if you look at the diagram, it creates a kind of palindrome. The A uniting it but it's also like a mirror of itself. What he also plays with here, which is very interesting, is the juxtaposition of what is called parallel major and minor. The funeral march is in C minor, the contrasting B material is in C major. So it's the same key, but the third of the scale is raised. Then we go back to C minor, then an F minor in uh, adventure, C minor, C minor again. So what you also then will get here is that it's not all funeral march. The contrasting episodes create 
lightness, and sometimes even agitation. But we always keep coming back to the original funeral idea, third movement. Here, you have a scherzo. Now, I have to do another definition of an Italian term for you. A scherzo is basically a joke, something that's funny, something that's lighthearted, and we need it after a funeral march that is so profoundly sad. Here we have a study in scales, scales that go up, scales that go down. Schumann is playing here also with an old form that we have seen before, which is the minuet and trio. Here, it's no longer dance related, but if you see the form trio that comes from the minuet and trio, one of the contrasting sections, the trio, the first violin and the viola are actually playing in canon. That's like row, row, row your boat, but a more sophisticated form where a second voice enters and imitates what the first voice does, but may not be in the same key. Second trio, there is a use of perpetual motion. This is a kind of musical representation of something that just goes on and on and on and on, but it's not boring. Eventually, we get to the scherzo theme that started it all, and then it's um, tied up neatly with a little coda section, final movement. Now, of all the four movements, this is the most brilliant. This is the, I use the word crowning jewel of the piece for lack of a better term, all of the brilliance of the entire work is kind of summed up here. You have a basically sonata form, but Schumann is now far enough into the 19th century that he doesn't feel hemmed in by a strict adherence to the sonata form. So you will hear the piano announce this principal theme and the strings are uh, accompanying it with this repeated note uh, format. Second theme is in contrast to it because it's more song-like. And don't forget that Schumann is a great master of song. So the fact that he would get a song-like theme as a second uh, idea in this is typical of his kind of gift. When we get to the development it's interesting that he's kind of already presented so much musical protein that he doesn't need to do a great deal of experimentation here. It's really on the subdued side, and he gets more involved with that song-like material than the original um, theme. There's a standard recapitulation where these two ideas are again presented, and by this time, they are quite familiar to you. You don't have to, at this point, really even think to yourself, oh, there are the two themes. You've already gotten to know them very well. And then we get a coda, and this is where Schumann really shows his gifts. This coda includes a double fugue. So if we go back to flights of birds, there is a flight of birds taking off from this tree and another flight of birds taking off from this tree, and they're all flying along, chasing each other. And eventually, like wonderful formation pilots, they actually fly between each other. So the theme one and theme two of the first movement get included in it. This is or theme, I'm sorry, theme one from this movement and theme one from the first movement are woven into it. Now, we have here, again, a wonderful uh, music history observance with the Vermeer String Quartet as the strings and a very beloved early member of the history of Bay Chamber Concerts Tom Wolfe's brother, Andy, who tragically passed away far too early. He is the pianist in this performance, which, as I 
Seen on My Notes was made in 1982. Thank you very much for listening, and I hope you enjoyed the performance. Perhaps I can also encourage you, even though you can't see a video of Andy playing the piano part, watch a video of this piece. It's fascinating to see how the string quartet interacts with the pianist. See you soon.